and with Anne. And did you know that he's one of the 300 Canadians living in the Bay Area today? <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> Without further ado, David Shenandy. I'm going to take this on the other side. <laughs> I don't want to give my speech on this side because I need to click on my computer. Okay, Moore's Law. How many people here know what Moore's Law is or what it says? So some? All right. Um, how many people know what a transistor is? Mm -hmm. How many people know what an iPod is? <laughs> <laughs> so if you said at least no to one of those questions, I can probably answer it. If you said no to iPod, I'm not sure if I can help you. So what is a transistor? First of all, what did a transistor replace? This, the vacuum tube. I don't really know much about it, um, but you can see by the size of it, it fits in a hand. And this was around in the early first half of the 1900s. So this is what a transistor is. Basically, it's the fundamental building blocks of all of electronics. It replaced the vacuum tube. Transistor was created in, or just invented in the 40s. It's basically an electronic switch. So you can turn it on and off, like a light bulb. It can be on or off based on certain properties. Um, you probably know it's made of uh, silicon, which is, sem is a semiconductor, so it can con conduct electricity or insulate. So that's how it either has an on state when it conducts electricity or an off state when it does not conduct electricity. So this side, you can't tell the scale, but it's about maybe a centimeter long. So and it has wires sticking out the bottom, which you can connect to other electrical components. And what you can do with this is make a transistor radio. So this is one of the earliest applications of the uh, transistor. And you can see the board in the middle where there have, there's electrical components. And there's not that many components to it, so it's not a terribly complicated um, device. But this was one of the first uh, uses of the transistor. The next breakthrough came about in the 50s when they realized that instead of having all these different electrical components, you can fit everything onto one chip. So basically here, they still had to solder individual components. So you have maybe 20 components here, a person would have to solder them together. Uh, Fast forwarding a little bit, how many know about how many transistors there are in a modern CPU or computer? It's about close to a billion. So you can't imagine, you can't make a modern computer out of these type of components. So in the 50s, they figured out that they can fit these transistors on these chips, which is, ba which is basically silicon, and you can put more than one component on these chips. And these chips are about the size of a human fingernail. So from here, um, due to the manufacturing process, they realized that they can continually fit more transistors on the same area and scale them. And that's where Moore's, Law's com Moore's Law comes from. Moore was one of the co-founders of Intel. And he noticed in the 60s, he noticed a trend and he extrapolated and he said, the number of transistors that you can fit on one of these chips will double approximately every two years. So that brings us so from the beginning when you had maybe 10 transistors to today where you have a billion transistors, so you can see how that, how that exponential uh, doubling has gone over the past 40 years. So now we realize that we, can, we have a lot of transistors, so we went from 10 to 100 to 200 to 1,000 to a million. What can you do with them? So we did a transistor radio was the first application, but with these integrated circuits, you could keep making more complex devices. Basically, you could implement logic functions. So if you know any Boolean logic functions like an AND, OR, or NOT. So here we have the AND, so on the left-hand side, that's the kind of electrical symbol 
a circuit symbol for the AND function. So basically, the output is a function of the input. For the AND, if both of the inputs are on, or yes, or high, or true, then the output is true. So on the right, you have a truth table. So you see the output is only a one when both of the inputs A and B are one. So here we've used transistors, maybe 10 or 20 transistors to implement that circuit. And it, and it, give, and it lets you build that building block, the AND, we call it AND gate or AND function. Now you can combine these, func these building blocks, the AND or the OR or the NOT logical function, then you can make those, combine those to make the basic elements of a computer. So you can have your CPU, your memory, and basically that was the start of the uh, computer. And as the manufacturing costs came down, the computer entered the uh, consumer market. And here's what Moore's Law basically says. In the 1970s, you can see a uh, computer had about a thousand transistors. And then here in 2004, you're at about a billion. Now, my first computer, I think, was a 486, so that was in the late 80s. So you had a million transistors, and today it has a billion, so a thousand times more transistors on a chip. And you don't see it here, but the 486 was running at about 550 megahertz, so it could the clock would tick 50 million times a second. In today's computers, it takes four gigahertz at four billion times a second. So that's what Moore predicted in the 60s, and it has pretty much been true so far. But you notice, if you've been keeping up with the computer in the past few years, it hasn't been getting faster. And why is that? That's because now we've been hitting a power, a power limit and also because we want mobility. So we have power constraints. So if you think about it, the transistor, every time it switches from zero to one, it uses some power. So when we had one million transistors flipping from zero to one at 50 million times a second, today we have one billion transistors flipping from zero to one at four billion times a second. So that's a lot of power usage. So the number of transistors is still increasing. We can still scale it for another 10 years or so until the fundamental size of transistor gets down to the atomic level where it can't really make it any smaller. But during that time, the next 10 years, you won't really be able to make them faster because it costs too much power. So what are people doing? Well, you notice in the last few years, we have multiple cores. So we're using all those transistors that we could still make and then putting them on a, as multiple CPUs on the same chip. And that is, has allowed us, basically, we've gone from Pong on the left there as a video game, to Steve Madden football on the right. That's where all the transistors have let, allowed us to do over the past 30 years. And like I said, in the next 10 years, there's gonna, we're not gonna be able to scale the transistors any further, so then there's gonna have to be some other kind of technology which replaces it as the transistor replaces the vacuum tube. And when that happens, there will be many ebullient EP scientists around the world. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.